Welcome and thank you for joining us as we receive another message from our awesome Bishop Earl A. Ross. I challenge you to study today's message and I pray it brings you comfort, peace, and encouragement during this time of crisis. New Smyrna Missionary Baptist Church is located at 4417 Douglas Street Northeast, Washington, D.C. Our phone number is 202-396-9095. Our church website is www.newsmyrnambc.org. Our website has a list of services and instructions for giving via Givelify. Luke 638 states, Give, and it shall be given to you good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure that you meet withal, it shall be measured to you again. Good evening. And once again, welcome to another telecast from the New Smyrna Missionary Baptist Church, Washington, D.C. Before we begin our lesson tonight, let me thank the members and those who contribute to the financial support of our church. We thank God for those who continue to see and supply the need the financial for the financial needs of the New Smyrna Church. We pray daily for our members and also for those who make financial contributions to the support of our church. We ask that you would continue to pray for us as we pray for you. We also want to wish you a happy Resurrection Day. Our lesson tonight comes from the book of St. John, the 20th chapter, verse 2. And it reads thusly, Then she runneth and cometh to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved, and said unto them, They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulchre, and we know not where they have laid him. And from these readings, we've attached a label that says, Who are you? looking for. In my now nearly 50 some years of church ministering, I can say that there aren't many things that I have not experienced personally or seen for myself, be it good or bad, be it believable or unbelievable. I can say without a doubt that there isn't much left that I have not yet been exposed to. I've been at the bedside of those as they transition. I've been in the courtroom as some received their sentences. I've done homegoing services of those who were near a hundred or more years old, as well as those whose caskets were no larger than a shoebox. Yet out of all of my experiences, there is one that I fear the most. There is one that I hold my breath until it has passed. And that's the one that we're going to deal with today. It's to come to the place where one, where one's loved one was once laid and to find that they are no longer there. It's the one that I fear the most where uh, I've seen widows pull up to a grave site and I have witnessed the expression on the widow's face as she got out of the funeral car and came to the place where the, her loved one was uh, supposed to be laying and discover that they are not there. I've come to the place 
where loved ones have come to their final resting place only to find out that the place that they were planning to say goodbye to their loved one is no longer theirs. In 2010, it was discovered that some 60,000 burial sites in Arlington National Cemetery had been grossly mismanaged. For there was hundreds of unmarked uh, headstones and uh, other places of, 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 of uh, labeled incorrectly, uh, graves that were empty and remains that had been moved without families being noticed or given permission of their moving. There's an inexcusable amount of mistakes uh, concerning this situation that have happened, not just uh, years or a couple of years ago, but uh, things that have happened as recent as Iraq and Afghanistan. I can recall that in this past 40 years, that there have been occasions that when we got to the burial site, we could not bury because somebody else was in the place where they had, where their loved one was supposed to be. Here, they, they have paid uh, year after year to pay for their loved one or for their final resting place, only to get to the graveyard and find that somebody else is in their place. Not only that, but uh, uh, there have been a time or two when that when we got to the grave site, uh, right there where they were supposedly to lay their loved one besides them in a site somebody was there in their site that overlaid their, their site and nobody in management took the time to correct the problem. Therefore, some, sometimes at, at a later time, a loved one had come looking to, to, to come to the grave, grave site, looking to pay uh, a visit or to pay some sort of homage to discover that the body of the one they love is nowhere to be found and nobody knows where or who they have laid them. In the first century church, uh, the women in our text would come and anoint the dead bodies with spices to assist their natural decay. For this was a Jewish process. So in this passage, we find these women coming to the grave site of Jesus to perform a traditional Jewish custom. These women who had been a part of Jesus's support team, uh, these women, who were happened to be witnesses to his ministry and his teaching and preaching, had now come to fulfill a Jewish traditional custom, for they had uh, forgotten that he had taught them that he would rise or be raised from the dead. So when they got to the burial site, they sought a dead Jesus, but much to their surprise, a totally different situation awaited them. He was not there amongst the dead. And as it was with those Jewish churches or church women in that day, that's in our passage, so it is with many of us today. Many of our churches today have become sepulchers. 
Many of our churches today have become places of the dead rather than places of life. We come to the church for the wrong come to the we come to the to the wrong place, which is the church, to do the wrong thing, which is to anoint a dead person. We come to the church that is now a sepulchre. We come to the wrong place to do the wrong thing to the wrong person. We come to worship the wrong Jesus, for we come to bury him rather than to praise him. We, we, we worship dead Jesus rather than the one who was dead, but is now alive forevermore. So the question comes from, from, the, from, the, from the writings of Luke's report the, the, so the, of the resurrection of Jesus Christ in Luke 21, or Luke 24, rather, 1 through 6, teaches us that early Sunday morning, they came to the sepulchre with spices that they would finish preparing the body of Christ. When they got to the place to finish off his burial, they found that number one, the stone had been rolled away. Victory had been declared over the dead and the grave. Yet they were in with that yet they entered in with their preparation offering to finish burying Jesus' dead body, only to find that he is not present. And it is, it is there that the Bible asks the most, the most profound question. For the angel asks of the saints of that day, who are you looking for? Luke 24 and 5. Why seek ye here the living among the dead? He is not here. And as it was in those days, the question today, as we stand facing all the situations that we are facing today, we are asked the question by heaven, who are we looking for? When we come to church on Sunday morning, when we come especially on Resurrection Sunday morning, who are we looking for? Because if you're looking for Jesus, he is not here. He has risen as he said he would. Don't you remember what he told you in Galilee and what our text is teaching us today is the same thing that he taught us years ago. We're being asked today in the midst of all of the viruses and things that are going on, who are you looking for? Our society is suffering from a sick, from the sickness of a misplaced Jesus. For I can tell by your testimony that the Jesus that some of you are serving is not the Son of God. So I challenge you today as, as, as Christians, what do you think? about the viruses? What is your concern and conception of the future concerning what's going on in our world today? Do you stand like Mary weeping at an empty tomb? Or do you remember what he told us in Galilee? I challenge you today that if you were Mary, had gotten up this resurrection day and came out to the church, who would you and what would you be expecting? 
when you got up this morning and came came and got your dress and uh, came all the way across town to your church, uh, wherever you had come from, what are you expecting today? Who are you expecting to worship? Who are you expecting to adorn? Does your offering come to a further bury him or does your offering come to lift him higher so that all the world can see? It all depends on who you or how much you recall about Galilee. What is it about Galilee that is so important that we must remember in times like these? So let me ask you, how does the empty tomb impact you? Is the tomb your church where Jesus is? And is the Jesus that's in your church dead or alive? Is your church empty of Jesus? Is your church a tomb of a dead Christ? Are you going to pray for me? So let me ask you, how does the empty tomb impact you? Does it cause you to ask, is this the Christ? Or do we look for another? Please inform me today as to who you're looking for. This is the question that our, our nation is facing today. Who do we, who are we looking for? We, 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 cannot, we cannot ask this question of Congress. We can't ask this question of our president. But now who are you looking for? Who are you looking for, for the answer to all of our problems and situations in our country? Now, I need you to give me your full attention. For well, there is a great message unfolding here at the burial site of Jesus Christ. So I need you to listen carefully to the teaching. First of all, I want you to get it in your Noah that the Old Testament is from Genesis to the book of Acts, and that the New Testament begins in the Acts of the Apostles with the post-resurrection of Jesus Christ. You got to get those thoughts in your mind so that you will understand that sometimes what you read in the Old Testament, it may have the same wordings in the New Testament, but they don't mean the same thing. I cannot overemphasize the fact that what you have to offer in the church determines who you're looking for. In the Old Testament and in the uh, passage of scripture uh, that surrounds our text, we find that it was getting close to the sundown and the sunrise of a new Sabbath. So the women had come after the crucifixion to anoint the dead body of their Christ. Now, we understand that they would wrap a shroud around the dead body, and this wrap would go around several times and that they would start wrapping the body in these wraps. And between each later layer, they would put these ointments made out of wood and spices in between each layer. That they would start or begin wrapping the arms and the legs first. And so it was getting close to the, the, the going down of the day and the awakening of a new Sabbath. And so they did not finish wrapping or preparing the body for its burial. But early the next morning, early that Sunday morning, they got up and came to the sepulcher with the spices that they could prepare 
the dead body of Jesus Christ. And so again, I ask you, who are you looking for? Who, who did you come to worship today? Because it's what's in your hand that testifies and gives witness to who you really came to worship and to what you came and what, what service did you come to offer your Christ? If you've got dead stuff to offer Christ, we want you to know he is not here. There is no way that we can offer our, our spices that belong to the dead to one who has already risen from the dead. And that's what, what, we, what the text is all about. And, and, and the thing that we have forgotten is what Jesus told them in Galilee. That's why in Galilee is so important in the story background of the text. He told them in Galilee that, that he was going to be offered up into the hands of sinful men, that he was going to have to die for sin, but on the third day, he was going to rise again. So automatically, it's proven that they had forgotten what he taught them, like many of us have forgotten that God has made a promise to make a way out of no way. If you're coming and concerned about the virus, if you're coming concerned about all of diseases that in, the, in, our, in our country, then you're coming to worship the wrong Jesus. Jesus, because our Jesus has promised us that if this earthly tabernacle shall dissolve, we got another building not made by hand, that by his stripes we are already healed, that he sent his word to heal us. So if you're coming today with with a, a testimony and with offerings that you want to give to Jesus' dead body, we want you to know that you're in the wrong church. You're in a sepulchre, a church of dead, of, of a dead Jesus. And that's what's, what's plaguing our country today. That's what's plaguing our land today. And this is what we ought to be praying about, is that our churches are geared towards a dead Jesus. Our songs, our preaching, our teaching is all geared to help bury Jesus. But Jesus, who is real, the son of the living God, is not in the dead church. That's why we don't have any healing today. That's why we don't have any deliverance. That's why we don't have any casting out of demons. That's why the devil is running rampant. That's why we got to close up everything by eight o'clock. That's why we got to put on masses. That's why we got to, we, 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 we're scared to touch one another. It's because the church is now worshiping a dead Jesus. And we have come to bury him rather than to lift him up so that all men can see him because he declared that if I, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me, but that that Jesus has no drawing power. So I need, I need you to look at what you got in your hands. I need you to pay strict attention to this particular text because these women have come with a tradition. Regardless of what Jesus had told them in Galilee, and I'm afraid that we're suffering from the same situation, we've forgotten what Jesus told us in Galilee. And so we don't come with praise, we come to bury him. We've come to finish burying him. And when uh, they got to the tomb where he was, he had been laid, they forgot to look for the signs. They forgot to uh, recognize that uh, something had already, that he had told them about, had, had already taken place. It's the first number thing is that the stone had been rolled away. All of the opposition and all of the situations that have stood between uh, our soul and our Savior has now been moved. All of, the, all of the problems now have now been taken away 
And they did not recognize, like many of us, that the stone had been rolled away. Tradition has been rolled away. Politics has been rolled away. Dictatorship has been rolled away. All of the demonic powers of Satan now have been rolled away. And an angel from heaven sets on the stone to notify us that the stone had been rolled away. The next thing that we notice is that when they got inside the tomb, the clothes or the cloths that had been used to wrap the dead body in were still in place. They were not lying ruffled in the corner, but they were lying as if he had just slipped out of them like a hand slipping out of a glove. And that the napkin was laid folded and not ruffled as if he had laid the cloth carefully because he was in no hurry, because he knew that he had already done what needed to be done. His cloth was laid and folded comfortably, letting them to know that it wasn't a, a rush job, that nobody just snatched him out, but that he rose in his own spirit. All of these things were signs to let us know that if you are not worshiping the right Jesus, you're in the wrong place. Listen at it. Look, look at it. Look at that. I want you to get, I get this in your Noah. That, that in Luke 24, we read where early in the morning, the women came to the tomb with spices. They came with the wrong thing. What did you come for and come with this morning? I know it's a little redundant here, but I need to drive these points home to you. What did you come here with this morning? What was in your heart? Did you come with worship? Did you come with some uncertainty? Did you come knowing and believing that God is God and he has, has done what he promised to do? What do you have? In your hand. What, what is in your hand? Now, remember that sometimes the same words that we use or see in the Old Testament are also in the New Testament, but they have a different or more complete interpretation. For example, let's take the words believed and believeth. In Luke 24, we read where early Sunday morning they came to the tomb with spices to complete the burial of Jesus. But when they got there, they found only an empty tomb. Two men dressed in shining garments who asked them, why seek ye? the living among the dead. He is not here, they said. But in, but he, but is risen as he said. He further reminded them of what he told them, what he had, that he had to suffer at the hand of sinful men. That Mary Magdalene and the others, they went and told the disciples what had taken place at the tomb. Are we listening as people remind us of what has taken place already? And, or are we so caught up in what we have seen that we no longer believe what we have been told? Because you see, believe, E-D, means 
what you see now. But believest means you believe what you have previously believed. Now, when the, the, when the women came and told the apostles what they had seen, they forgot all about what they had previously believed and counted it as idle talk, silliness of women. I wish I had a praying crowd here today. Not only that, but look at this. When Peter heard it, Peter got up and ran into the sepulchre and he did six things. When you read that text, he did six things. Six things are printed here for us to look at. He ran to the sepulchre. He stooped down at the sepulchre. He saw what was in the, the, in the sepulchre and he re departed in wonder. Look at it. Look at it again. He ran to the sepulchre. In fact, he, 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 John got there first, but then Peter got there. He ran to the sepulchre. He ran into the sepulchre and he did, and he knelt down and saw what was in the sepulchre. And then he came out and regardless of what he seen, even though he had seen it before, he didn't believe what he saw. <clears throat> and he left out with wonder. He did everything but believe it. He believed what he saw, but he didn't believe what he had previously believed. Mark 16, 16 says, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But without the baptism, if you believe it, you are still saved. If you can believe what Jesus said, you can and will be saved. We've got to make up in our minds, do we believe what we have seen and heard, or do we just believe what we see and read in the newspaper now? What do you have in your hand, and what have you come to do with what you have in your hand? Tell me today, who are you looking for in the midst of all of this virus and all of the newspapers reporting that all the things that people are saying and people are dying here and there? What do you believe and who are you looking for? Are you looking to die or are you looking to live? Are you looking for the Savior who gives life or are you looking for death? Tell me this morning. In the midst of all that's going on, who are you looking for? May the blessings of the Lord rest heavily upon your life and do you good in the day. From of the dead, he's a better in the time of the battle. He's a better After hearing the word and receiving instructions for giving, we must not forget about the soul. So I have one question to ask. If Jesus came back right now, would you go back with him? If your answer is yes, praise God for your salvation. If your answer is no, join me in reciting the sinner's prayer. Lord, I confess my sins and I ask for your forgiveness. Please come into my heart as my Lord and Savior. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. I encourage you to find a Bible-believing church or join us in New Smyrna Missionary Baptist Church. Remember, we are blessed, we are victorious, and no weapon formed against us shall prosper.